All right, welcome everyone to this special edition of, um, it's a joint session of Map Time Davis and also UCGIS Week. Um, so for those of you who are Map Time regulars, you know what this is. Um, we are a uh, basically a meetup uh, that's been happening online since the pandemic started. Uh, we used to meet in person, but Zoom has been easier. Uh, we get together um, during the quarter for UC Davis and we talk about mapping technologies and we learn new things together. Um, and then for those of you who don't know what UC GIS Week is, UC GIS Week is um, another thing that came out of the pandemic. Um, it is a, a joint effort between uh, UC staff members to produce, um, instead of having GIS day, we can get together and we can make something larger. Uh, in this case, it's a three day online conference that highlights things that are going on at the UC um, and with uh, current, you know, UC affiliates and also alumni. So I'm going to paste some links in the chat for you. Um, some things that you might be interested in. We've got um, a link to the Map Time Davis YouTube channel that has our um, all of our recordings, not all of them, but most of our recordings that we've done over the last few years. Um, we also have links to the UCGIS week uh, schedule and information page. And then finally, the last link that I put in the chat is the links to the workshop materials for today, if you haven't seen that already. Um, so that's where uh, that gives you a uh, I guess situates you for why you're here. Hopefully you're here for one of those reasons. Uh, if you're not here for one of those reasons, just hang out with us. We're going to learn about some mapping today and hopefully you'll find it interesting. Um, so oh, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Michelle Tobias. I am the, uh, basically I do geospatial data science at UC Davis Data Lab. Um, we are housed within the UC Davis Library and we help people with data science and um, all kinds of things related to data science and data and data in general. Um, today's workshop is about um, cartography, specifically related to making figures for academic publications. So things like uh, figures for books and also for journal articles. Um, this is something I do in my career pretty regularly. Um, I help people on campus with creating figures uh, that communicate well for their, their journal articles and, and books and things like that, as well as for my own research work. Um, so that is a little background on what I do. Um, what I want to do next is um, share my screen and we'll get to the workshop materials. Sorry, I have a lot of windows open, which unfortunately need to be open. All right, so um, if you go to the workshop materials, um, link that I gave you. This is what you're going to see. It's a GitHub repository. Um, and if you scroll down on this page, you will see a bunch of text in the README document. And this is where the material and the, the text is for the workshop today. So you can feel free to follow along. Um, while I do the uh, introductory material, I will be showing this, but eventually I'll put this on the other screen and you can follow along. Um, and I'll be demonstrating some things. So we'll kind of start with some concepts today, um, and then we will dive into some hands-on material. So um, are there any questions before we get started? Give you a second to type in the chat if you have them. But otherwise, I think our um, helpers will just let me know if something comes up. OK. so. Not seeing anything right now, but again, helpers interrupt me as needed. Um, we're going to dive into some concepts. Um, somebody's asking, is QGIS 3.22 acceptable? Yeah, any any recent version of QGIS is going to be fine. So don't worry about that. You don't need to reinstall for now. Um, although maybe you'll see something in 3.26 that you're excited about and you'll have a reason to upgrade, but um, 22 should be fine. Okay, so um, today this workshop again is about cartography for map figures, and uh, we are gonna I'm gonna be demonstrating in QGIS 3.26 um, just because that's what I have and that's what I proved the materials for. You'll see that um, the last time I taught this we did 3.14 and some of the some of the like uh, what do you call menus and things like that. Some of the text has changed slightly, but for the vast majority of recent um, QGIS versions, it'll be pretty similar. So don't sweat it if you've got a slightly older version. 
Um, so this workshop is going to be divided into two sections. We're going to cover concepts and then and approaches, and then we're going to do some hands-on stuff. So um, one of the things I should mention too is that the concepts for this workshop are going to be applicable to pretty much any kind of figure you're making, whether it's maps or graphs or diagrams. Um, you know, there's some specifics that'll be different, but the generalities are all going to be the same. So whatever kind of figures you're making, this is probably going to be helpful. So the first section, the concepts, has absolutely no prerequisites. I don't expect that you come with any previous knowledge, except probably, you know, whatever your your domain is that you're you're in. Um, you know, we're not going to start from the beginning of science, but, you know, I think generally I'm not going to expect you to know too much about uh, anything in particular. In the hands on section, however, I'm going to I'm going to make the assumption that you know things about um, general spatial data formats like if I say raster and vector you're like I'm cool I know what that is generally. Um, and then also I'm going to assume that you have some experience with QGIS so I'm not going to take a lot of time to show some of the QGIS specifics that I would if we were doing the intro to desktop GIS with QGIS workshop. Um, so I may blow through some things um, quickly um, that I would normally stop and do if it was an intro workshop so um, feel free to ask questions if you can't find something the helpers will help you um, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the basics of that. Um, but if you generally have experience with the desktop GIS of any sort, you should be fine. But also, again, feel free to just watch. You don't have to follow along. We can catch you up on, on the rest of the details later. Um, so in preparation for this workshop, um, if you're going to follow along, you'll need to have installed um, some recent version of QGIS, and you'll want to grab the data from this uh, online repository link. Um, it's a box folder. It looks like this. Um, if you there's a download button in this uh, upper corner that you can grab it. You don't need to be logged into Box to get it. I do know a bunch of you downloaded it because it sends me these little updates that say people downloaded stuff. So good on you if you've already gotten it. If not, feel free to grab that right now. And then you're gonna wanna put that data somewhere where you can find it and unzip it. Okay, so that's sort of the, you know, preparation kind of stuff, the expectations. Now we are going to jump into the introduction and concepts. Um, so you probably already know this, right? Like when you download a journal article or you pick up a book, it's the first thing you do. You flip through it and you look at all the pictures, right? Um, I At least that's what I do. It's not that the text isn't important. It's just that the images often have this way of conveying information and telling me that the materials that are in this particular document are going to be useful. So um, it has an outsized amount of power to help us, uh, you know, to attract our attention to a particular article or things like that. Um, and being able to work with that you know, underlying tendency that we have as humans, uh, we can actually use that to our advantage, but we need to have a specific set of skills in order to do that well. And that's what we're going to learn about today. Um, and so map figures are a little bit different than other figures you might be making. Uh, some of the important things that are different when you're making um, map figures for, for academic publications that come up are things like restricted size. I've seen it's really common to have maps and also other figures um, be restricted to something really small like five by five inches. <laughs> That's not a lot of real estate. Um, you also often have restricted color palettes. You're making things in grayscale where you would really love to be able to have color, but you can't for whatever reason. You might also have a limited number of figures that you can have. So a lot of times journals will say you can only have three images or um, book publishers are really um, really good at doing that that's pretty common is you know per chapter you can only have so many figures um, the other things that you need to think about um, in particular when you're publishing images um, and data is can you cite your data and you have license uh, to use it uh, licenses can be restrictive on data um, and you may be able to use it for your research, but the publisher may not be able to publish it if it's not licensed in a way that um, allows them to work with it. So these are things we need to think about we're going to talk about those today. Um, other key concepts for today. Um, 
that will keep coming back to you. You'll hear me say over and over again. Um, the first one is minimize. You're only going to keep what's absolutely necessary. You only have a few inches to work with, so we're going to only keep the things that really matter. Um, the other important thing is tell your story. Um, we're going to talk a lot about like, what's the story I'm trying to tell? Does my map help convey that story? And then communication, that's related also to storytelling. But are the choices that you're making in the way that you represent your data communicating well and telling the reader what they need uh, to see and helping them along their way to understanding that story that you want to tell? Um, so today we're going to go through kind of um, a little bit of my personal workflow and you may develop a, a different workflow as you get uh, more experience with this and that's totally fine. I just want to offer what I do as a starting point. Um, so I'll pause here and see if we have any questions. I don't see anything in the chat right now, but feel free again to keep uh, keep those coming. All right, so um, first thing we're going to talk about is um, telling our story. So throughout this, I've got some examples of, of my own work because it's my work, so I can put it where I want it. <laughs> so again, license, um, that's important. Um, but the first concept we want to talk about is what story are you telling? Um, why are you making the map you're making? Um, we don't want to just put maps into, into a publication. It's got, it has to be there for a reason. Um, what do you want the reader to learn from your map? So I have an example here of a map that is in a book by Eric Smudin, who is a professor on the UC Davis campus. Um, I worked with him. He published this book and needed to make a map to help people understand the locations of cinemas in Paris uh, so that they could understand the relationships between the places that he was talking about in the book and why they're important and how people could travel between them. Um, so this is um, in particular a book of, about the time period between the 1930s and the 1950s. Um, and he needed people to understand not only the locations of the cinemas, which you can see in, um, they have the black squares, um, but also the relationship between the streets, which are in grayscale, um, they're in gray. And then um, we've got the metro lines in uh, with black lines with diamonds for the stops. <clears throat> so you can easily see how a person could get from one place to another um, when they get on the subway, they could get between those two cinemas fairly quickly. And that was the point that this map was supposed to make. So the map by itself, I think, is, is fairly clear. You've got two important locations. You've got some metro lines. Um, and with the context of the text around it, hopefully this helps. They both feed off of each other and help you understand. So that's an example of a story that is being told with the map. And the map is supporting that analysis and that um, the text that's in the book. So that's what you want to go for when you're making these maps. There needs to be a reason for why that map is there and a, a clear reason of what, or a clear uh, indication of what you're trying to get your reader to understand. Now, underlying all of this, of course, is the data. Um, we're not just drawing these, you know, with pen and paper, we're actually bringing in digital data to do this. Um, so you need to figure out what data do you need to tell your story. So in case of this um, Paris cinema map, um, you can see we needed to have the road network. So that's the gray lines. Um, so we needed to bring that in. We also needed the metro lines. So this is all data that was imported into QGIS. And then um, the cinema locations. Uh, and the cinema locations honestly required some processing because we only had addresses to start. So I did a process called geocoding, where you're taking uh, street addresses and you're turning them into latitude, longitude locations. And the nice thing is that even though this is about uh, the time period between the 1930s and the 1950s, uh, Paris, the Paris road network hasn't changed very much. Uh, in that time period. So we're able to use the current road network to do all of this analysis. If this was um, someplace like a developing you know, city in the Midwest or something in the US, uh, we might have had to do a lot more work to process all of that. So that's something to keep in mind is that you not only do you have to get the data, but you may also have to process the data and you may have to do some analysis to get the data in the shape that you need it in order to make the maps. So that's something to think about um, and something we're not going to cover today. I've actually processed your data for you um, just to because data processing is in the point of this workshop. Um, the next thing that you need to think about um, and 
I really encourage you to think about this part as early as you can is the journal art specifications. So um, you don't just get to make a map. You have to fit your map into what the publisher wants. Um, so I think it's really important to know what, what your restrictions are going to be early because otherwise you can make this beautiful map and then find out you have to shave two inches off either side of your map and then all of a sudden you can't, can't read anything. <laughs> um, so it's better to plan ahead. So publisher specs can be specifications. I'm going to say specs because that's shorthand, but I mean specifications. Um, the publisher specs can be really restrictive. Um, and so that's why you want to know what you're dealing with earlier rather than later. Um, I like to think of this as a driver for creativity, but to be honest, sometimes it can be pretty frustrating. Um, so you want to put on your creative thinking hat how you're going to get around some of these things and how you're going to work with it. Um, and we're going to talk today a little bit um, when we get in the hands-on portion about how to deal with some of this. Um, but you definitely want to prepare for this and plan ahead because um, the last thing you want is for your the art staff for the journal to decide to alter your map for you. Um, because that can, if they change like the aspect ratio or things like that, they can actually be altering data, which you don't want. Um, and you don't want things like they might not understand some of the rules of cartography, like that you don't want your labels crossing things and stuff like that. So um, it's much better to work with their specs up front and get that all settled so that you don't end up with the art staff changing your images for you. Um, or having to redo the map a hundred times to fit the specification. So um, it's good to think about this up front. So we're going to take a look at um, the art specs for the nature journals. Um, I just grabbed these ones because they were all on one page, to be honest, um, but we're going to work with these later. So if we take a look, this is um, the formatting guide for nature for their publications. And so you can see if you go to this link too, you can scroll through here. Um, I'm going to try not to give you um, sea sickness by scrolling up and down too much. But um, what we want to do is find the part where they're talking about um, the art amount of articles. See, this is a really normal process. I'm like, OK, where is it? I know it's in here somewhere. Methods, references. So that's all about the text. And notes again, that's about the text, uh, reporting things. Okay, we're getting into when they start talking about tables. This is where I start paying attention. Um, I'm not going to read the tables right now, but there might be something useful in there. Uh, figure legends, that's really helpful for later. Uh, figures, this is what we need. Um, so, this section about figures is going to give you a lot of information. Um, like, first thing that I'm seeing is figure costs. Like, okay, I got to pay attention to that. Um, and then it looks like it stops. So this section on figures is probably the bulk of what I need. Um, so you can read through this um, and find some of the important information. Um, they will also throw in things that as map makers, we're probably not that interested in like amino acid sequences. <laughs> um, there's going to be extra stuff in here that doesn't matter. There may be other sections of this document that do help us like the table section might have important information that could be helpful for us as well. Um, but I kind of gleaned some information out of there for you in the workshop material. So I'm just going to switch back over there and, and show you some of the things I would be looking for. So the first thing I'm going to look for is what is the figure size? How much real estate do I get on that page? Um, and if you scan through the document that we just looked at, you can see that they tell me some information here about um, how big it can be. So um, in this case, this is one of the journals that either does one column spans or two column spans. Um, and it tells you what the width is that you can have for those. So it can either be 89 millimeters or it can be 183 millimeters. And then it tells me the maximum length of the uh, image can be up to 247 millimeters high. So I either get a cho I get a choice of widths and then I can have any height that I want up to the maximum that they list. So sometimes these become a puzzle to figure out what they actually mean. <laughs> um, other things I'm looking at are things like aspect ratio. In this case, uh, nature doesn't specify, but I have had other journals specify instead of um, a maximum figure size, they give you an aspect ratio. Um, so that is the ratio between the height and the width of the image. So they are very specific about that for some reason. 
Other things you might be interested in are color guidance and restrictions. So I told you that on the, when I was skimming through the nature specs that I saw that there was different charges. <laughs> and that relates oftentimes to whether or not you can have color images. Um, for whatever reason, even though the majority of journals have an online version um, and a lot of them aren't even doing print anymore, they are still charging for color even though if it's going online it doesn't cost them more it used to cost more to print color um so they would charge but now it just seems to be um, a holdover where they can charge you more money um so in that case i would encourage you to learn to make really good grayscale images <laughs> the other reason uh, aside from avoiding uh, color charges is that um, a lot of times folks if they're going to print your article you know to take it with them somewhere, um, you know, if they can't bring their computer or their tablet or something with them, they may be printing it. And if they only have access to a black and white printer, you're going to communicate a lot better if you have your figures already in grayscale. You don't have to worry about them printing it and having like all the yellow drop out, for example. Um, so you can communicate really well if you can do that well in grayscale. Other things I'm looking for is guidance on um the font or restrictions on the font um in this case the nature journals don't have any restrictions on the font um, but i have worked with journals that or book publishers that will specify either you have to have a very specific font uh, or they will say that it has to be um, an open font so you want to make sure that as you're reading through these that you know what fonts you're allowed to use and which ones you are not because again you don't want the art staff to change your font and then that throws off the alignment of all your labels or you know things kind of go haywire if you change the font because of you know the width of characters and stuff like that um, so be careful of guidance on the fonts um, some journals just plain don't care um, and we'll talk about what your options are in a bit, um, but sometimes they get very specific about what they want. Um, other things that I care about are what is the image format and quality? Does it have to be a specific kind of image? Like, does it have to be a JPEG or does it have to be a TIFF? Um, what is the, um, the resolution that they want? Um, a lot of times they'll specify uh, that you need to have a certain uh, dots per inch dpi for your image um, and so the higher the dpi um, the better the image quality but also the larger the file size another thing to be aware of is that some journals will ask specifically for um, an eps file which is um, a native file format for adobe illustrator if you don't have access to illustrator it is fine to send them a plain svg which you can make an in inkscape and that will open just fine in illustrator um, another option is to send them a pdf um, and then they should be able as long as you don't um, compress the image down into just one raster they should be able to open that it as different layers in in illustrator or in inkscape so there are ways around that if they ask for a proprietary format um, the final thing I'm looking for is any other limitations that they might put on the images. So, um, for example, in uh, the nature specs, they specifically say that you cannot have multi paneled uh, images or figures like I can't split up my image into like four pieces and label them A, B, C and D unless the images are related to each other. So I could have like a time series and do uh, a multi panel like that, but I can't have like one, you know, Panel A is my study site, panel B is methods, uh, workflow, and then C is the results. Like they, they don't want that. Um, those would have to be separate figures. So those are all important things to know before we get started. It kind of starts making your brain think about like, how am I gonna put these figures together? Can I put them in one? Do they have to be separate? Um, I know that I'm making it grayscale because I don't want extra charges. So um, that's important for all of the specs. Um, and every journal has their own version of their specifications. Um, some of them are better than others. Some of them are more helpful than others. Some of them are just like, whatever, and then you just do your best. <laughs> others can be really, really specific. So just keep that in mind. And you wanna find those early, early in the process of planning uh, for your figures. 
All right, so then the next thing I'm going to do, once I find out what my specs are, I'm going to set up my page, and we'll do that um, when we get into QJS. I'll show you how to do that, but I usually set up my page size pretty quickly because it gives me an idea of what I'm working with and, again, gets the creative juices flowing. Next, after that, I'm going to start working with my design and my layout, and we'll see specifically how that all works when we get into the hands-on portion. But some considerations to think about now are things like fonts. So um, again, you're going to work with whatever fonts um, or font restrictions that your journal or publisher has. Um, but for readability, I'm going to suggest that you never go below eight point font. Um, that's not a hard and fast rule, but for the most part, um, people will be much happier with you if you don't go less than eight point. Um, you can break rules when needed, but um, you want to be really careful if you try to make your font smaller than that. I'm also going to recommend you only have one font. You can have two at the very most. <laughs> Remember, we're dealing with like itty bitty maps here. So if you put a ton of fonts on there, you're just going to clutter things up. So um, stick to one or two fonts. Um, there are font ver variations that come with a lot of fonts. So things like bold, slant, italic, light variations. Um, that'll give you more options within that, you know, particular font family. So um, you can use those. Those don't count as separate fonts. Those are just variants of, of one font. Um, but I would still be careful. You don't want to use all of them unless you absolutely need to. Um, it's probably better to work with other, uh, other means of communication than changing up your font style, too. So we're going to try to keep it simple. Um, so one font, maybe two, um, and we're going to be careful about using variants unless we absolutely need them. Okay, what font do you pick? Like now that I've told you all these rules, which one do you pick? Um, so for readability at small sizes, I'm going to suggest that you want a, a sans serif font. So um, you can look up these terms. Um, on Wikipedia if, if you want some really good detail about the difference between serif and sans serif fonts. But um, essentially right now on the screen, you're looking at a sans serif font. Everything is very straight across. There's no little fancy loop-de-loos or little like, you know, things hanging off the font. So if you open up like a, a word processor and um, type something in Calibri or Arial um, and then type something in Times New Roman, you'll see the difference between those. So Times New Roman is a serif font. It has little like, um, I forget what the technical term is. Um, people who are super into fonts, type it in the chat for me. Um, so it has these little like things that come off like the edge of the T, for example. Um, uh, they add fanciness to your font and can start cluttering up your map. Um, so because we're dealing with such small maps, sans serif fonts, the ones with the nice clean edges are the ones that are going to be easier to read and also better. Um, oh, Alex is saying it's called a serif. Duh. Thank you. <laughs> the things you can forget when you're on screen and being recorded. Um, so uh, anyway, um, you want to pick a sans serif font because it's not going to clutter things up as much. Um, and with the very limited limited real estate, you're going to have a much better time with a sans serif font. You could still use a serif font if you want, but you'll see um, once we get going that when you're trying to pack a lot of things in a small space, uh, the less extra fancy things on there, the better. Um, and Alex put a link in the chat to the Wikipedia article for serifs. Um, so uh, something else to look at if you're interested. My current favorite font is one called Glacial Indifference. It's an open font. Um, it's kind of got a mid-century modern vibe. It's not the answer for everything, but it is a nice font. So that's another another sans serif choice that I particularly like. In the workshop, we'll use Calibri because I think most people have access, but Arial is also another good standard choice. Um, some other font tricks you can think about is changing things like the line spacing, um, which is the spacing between the lines, but then you can also change the spacing between the letters, which is called kerning, uh, and that can make things take up more space or less space. Um, so you don't want to go too crazy with it, but that can be helpful, especially if you're doing things like labeling natural features. Um, and a quick 
caveat about downloading fonts. Be really careful when you download fonts. It's really easy to pick up a virus if you go to a site that's not reputable. So do some research on the sites you, you're thinking about downloading from before you grab a font. Um, and the other thing is that um, some fonts that are free will often be trial fonts and they won't have all the characters you want. Like they may have letters but not punctuation um, or they may be um, missing important characters like vowels <laughs> so they're they're intended for um, demonstration purposes so be careful when you're downloading uh, free fonts that one first of all you don't pick up viruses and two that your font has all the characters that you're expecting it to have um, so that's that's just something to be aware of the other things i'm going to be working with are visual hierarchy um, which is a very fancy way of saying what do i notice first um, so there's a couple of things that we're going to work with today. Uh, the first one being contrast. So um, I've got two squares here. One's white, one's black. And I have the same color gray lines going across them. And you will notice a difference between which lines have more visual impact, uh, depending on what background they're on. So we can't just say like, oh, black lines have more impact because if it's on a dark gray background it actually has less so um, contrast really is a function of uh, the item we're looking at and also the background that it's on so how different is that thing from its background the more different it is the more likely we are to notice it so that's something important you've kind of already seen this in some of the example maps that i've shown you um, that the high contrast things are the important things and the low contrast things are lighter and have less contrast. And the other thing we're going to be working with today is the size of things. So no surprise, we tend to notice the bigger things first. So probably when you looked at this, the first thing you noticed was this section here that says big text. One, because it's got high contrast, but two, because it's larger. Um, so keep that in mind. Larger things have more importance on a map. I think you all know this intuitively. I probably don't even need to say it, but just for you know, completeness, there you go. Um, so we'll think about that too. You know, the larger things are gonna be more important. If we want something to stand out, we're gonna make it bigger. It's particularly useful with like line width, for example, here, or with uh, points, we can make the points larger or smaller depending on how important they are. So here's another example of some of the concepts we just talked about. So notice the things that have more visual importance to you. They are the larger items. Perhaps they're the darker items that have more contrast. Um, you can see the road network here for the road network of Paris is washed out. We don't really care. It's there for reference. If we need it, we'll see it, but it's not screaming for attention. It's gray. It's fading to the background. What really pops out is the boundaries for the arrondissements and then also these black squares, which happen to also be cinema locations. So this is an overview map to show you where the cinemas are <clears throat> with respect to the whole uh, city of Paris. Um, so that kind of gives you an example of how we're um, how we're working with those concepts of visual hierarchy. So in this case, the um, contrast and then also the size of things. So the line width and, and things like that changes. And then here's an example of a similar concept using color. So um, if you're gonna be using color, you wanna contrast your bright saturated colors like the railroad lines here are super saturated colors. They stand out really well against the less saturated background colors. So we have rivers and things like that in blue, but it's a muted blue. They don't stand out very much. The topo lines are gray. They, they're not dark. They're not screaming for attention. We're letting these railroad lines that are saturated colors stand out and grab our attention. Um, so you really can still work with a limited color palette and use color to your advantage there to, to draw attention with something that's really a bold color. So another thing that I'm going to be working with is background data. Um, I like to think of the concept of a lot of people use the term base map, and I hate it because base map gets used to mean anything under the sun. Um, so I like to think about background data. Um, and I want my background data to help me tell my story. So chances are when you're thinking about any map you're going to make, your story didn't involve telling, you know, all of Google Maps or all of OpenStreetMap. Um, 
you really need to tailor it down. So I'm not going to use tile services, for example, of any sort, unless I really, really need to, even though like the OSM tiles are super awesome. They've got so much stuff in them. In fact, they probably have too much stuff in them. I don't need everything that is showing in those tiles, um, either for Google Maps or, or OpenStreetMap. So I'm going to get that data and then pare it down and only keep the things that I need. So maybe I only need the roads. I don't need to know all of the grocery stores and hospitals and you know, fast food places. That's not telling my story. I need to pick out the things that I actually want to tell. Um, the other thing is that if you can get vector data, you're going to have much smoother options for lines. It's going to be cleaner than um, if you're trying to work with raster data. Um, also, raster data, you can only use one at a time, right? Like it's full coverage. It's going to block out anything it sits on top of. So vector data is going to be your friend for layering up a lot of information. And then a word about air photos. Um, I love air photos. I like to take my own air photos, um, but they are really hard to use in a map like this. So I'm generally going to avoid them unless they really help tell my story. So dropping in the satellite data tile service layer from my favorite, you know, air photo place is not going to help. Um, the reason is because there's so much detail in those. And then also, if I put any polygons on top of an air photo, I've already blocked out data that's there. Um, so it's really hard to work with rasters in this case and tell the story well. So be really careful when you're working with that kind of data in, in these maps that um, it's, help, it's helping you tell the story you want to tell. So I might use an air photo specifically for like a, a site uh, image where I'm trying to explain about like what the study site looked like. And then I would use annotations really carefully so I don't block out a whole lot of data. Um, but if I just need to show like sort of a plan of the area, I probably am not going to use an air photo. So just be aware of that. You really want to be careful with satellite tile services and air photos and things like that, that you're actually telling your story and not cluttering things up or um, accidentally erasing data by putting like a polygon in. <clears throat> the next interesting thing about uh, maps that go in books and things like that is that you get figure captions. You never got this when you did your intro GIS class. They're like, put a title at the top, right? <laughs> um, no titles. We don't need titles. We have figure captions. Um, so be aware that um, your map is going to be sitting in context, not only with the text of the chapter or the journal article um, text as well. Like it gets that context. Um, but also you get this figure caption where you can explain things. So um, be aware of that. Um, you can use it sometimes in place of not only the title of a map, but also sometimes you can get rid of the legend entirely if you um, use your figure caption well. So you get more map real estate. Um, and I've got a you know map in the wild here in a book chapter that I published with some colleagues where um, you've got a pretty extensive figure caption that kind of gives this more context. So we don't need things like titles and stuff like that. We can put it in text for the figure caption so that um, we've got more map real estate, even though we've only got a little page. Actually, it's in this book. This is a book. It's sitting right here on my desk. It's disappearing in Zoom. But anyway, um, so that's a map in the wild that's showing you that you can use the figure captions uh, to your advantage. Um, a side note about that is more and more I'm seeing publishers require that you put your uh, cartographer's name in the figure caption, um, even if you are an author. Like I'm an author on this chapter, but they still wanted to specify who made the map because they want to make sure that you have the ability to publish it. Um, and then this map didn't come from somewhere else. We didn't pick it up out of somebody else's book. They want to know that it was original work. So just be aware of that. Um, and then map elements. So I mentioned that um, you can use your figure caption to help you, you know, avoid putting certain things on your map like titles. Um, you almost never need a title in the kind of maps we're going to make today. Um, you're going to put that in the figure caption. Um, legends are at your discretion. Um, you know, if it's something you can explain in the figure caption and you think the reader will notice it, you maybe don't need to have a legend and then you get a little bit more real estate. Um, so again, simplicity is your friend. Um, also scale bars and north arrows. Um, I will say I have, when I was a graduate student, <clears throat> I TA'd the intro GIS class, two of them um, on the UC Davis campus. And I will say this was the checklist of things every map must have, right? 
but when you make them for a journal or a book, you often don't need any of this stuff. So, um, you know, that's great for an intro class, but when we're making these kinds of maps, we're gonna be a little bit more judicious about what we include. So I will tell you, sometimes you do not need a scale bar. Sometimes you don't need a north arrow. If your reader will be able to figure things out, especially because of the context of the rest of the material, the map does not need to stand alone. You're gonna have that context so you can leave those things out. Um, and here's an example of a map. This is a map of Arizona. We left out the boundaries of Arizona. There is no North Arrow. Um, there's no scale because this goes with a series of other maps and also the text of the chapter. It didn't need any of those things. So think about what your reader already is bringing to the map, and you may be able to um, you may be able to leave out some things and make a, a much cleaner map than if you try to include everything under the sun. Um, so this this map figure actually becomes more like a diagram than a map, but it communicates what it needs to communicate. And if you're like, what does this communicate? Read read the book chapter, I'll send you a PDF of it and you'll understand because it needs the context in order to operate. But it gets that because it's in that particular book chapter. Um, a couple more things to think about are things like image export. So we talked about how you wanna look at your uh, specs for your publisher and find out what the publisher wants. Um, sometimes they will ask for something very specific. Sometimes they will leave it up to you entirely. If they ask for something specific, deliver it. Um, but be aware that you may have uh, size restrictions. So you might have to kind of hedge on some of this. Um, like I mentioned here that if they don't, if they don't ask for 600 DPI or higher, I'm probably going to send them 600 DPI. But just this week, I was working with um, a professor in the wildlife department and they wouldn't take the 600 dpi images because they were too large <laughs> so we had to pare them down in order to be able to have them submitted so these are all things you might have to work with but i'm going to try to send the highest resolution i can on any map just because um, we can always downsize but we can't make the image quality better so if the journal needs to make it smaller they can but they can't make it less fuzzy <laughs> so we're going to plan for that and I think this is the final concept before we jump into the hands-on portion, licensing. Um, it's really important that you understand that data can have a license and the license can restrict what you are allowed to do with it legally. Um, so when you're downloading data from the internet, um, you know, if it's someone else made the data, you need to find out what the license is for that. Um, the first reason is because you need to know if you're allowed to use it for your own work. Um, the concept of being able to use work for research and education kind of broadens our ability to use it in those contexts. However, it does not extend to your publisher. So if you have data that you're working with, um, for example, you can use uh, Google's data because you're using it for research and education. The publisher may not be able to publish that um, and you would be responsible for obtaining the license and the permission to be able to use it. Sometimes people like Google will let you use certain things with attribution, so you should do that, but it's a lot easier to find these things out before you start rather than you made the map and now you have to figure out how to deal with the fact that the publisher won't publish the map because <laughs> they can't get permission for the, the license on the data. So check those things out. And um, honestly, I actually have a README file in most of my data folders. When I download something, I'll put the link to where I got it, who's you know the person that published it or the entity that published it, and then some information that I can find about the license. Um, you know, is it open licensed? Is it CC BY, for example? You know, do I have to just give them credit? Things like that. Um, but those are things you want to document because your publisher may need to know it in order to publish your maps. <laughs> it's a lot easier to know that up front than try to find it later and remember where you put things and where you got them from. Um, so just be aware of that. You definitely want to pay attention to the license. And it is one of those things like it takes time and you don't want to bother doing it, but you will save yourself a lot of work in the long run if you do it before you get started. Um, and you'll see the workshop materials. I have a, a readme file for you with um, information about where I got the data. Okay, so do we have any questions um, about concepts before we jump into the hands-on portion? Feel free to put them in the chat, um, or if um, if you feel comfortable unmuting and asking a question, that would be okay as long as we don't have a ton of people trying to talk over each other. Maybe raise your hand first and then we'll, we'll call on you if you wanna unmute. Um, 
or type your question in the chat and that'll that'll solve all of it. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions come up, but I'll give you just another second to do that. Great. <laughs> trying to get the participants window open, but Zoom is like, nope, I'm not doing it. All right, so I'll just re rely on, um, uh, I'll rely on our helpers to help me with that, so. Okay, so hearing no uh, questions or seeing no questions in the chat, I think we'll just go ahead and move on um, to the hands-on portion. So um, what I'm going to do now, just so you know what's going on, is I'm going to move my uh, workshop materials that I've been showing you, I'm going to move that onto my other screen to make room for QGIS, but I'm still going to be working on the same document. So if you want to follow along with me, you can do that. Um, I'll be working from the exact same document we've been working on, um, but I'm going to, I only have so much real estate. Okay, so um already previewed for you that I've got QGIS open already for reasons. Um, okay, so our exercise today, um, the premise of our exercise, the, the story we're going to tell is um, we're going to, um, I guess we're going to pretend, let's say we're going to pretend, I'm looking for a better word, but I can't come up with one. Um, we're going to pretend that we're making a journal uh, article that is about the underpinnings of the distribution of cryptozoology sightings in the northeastern U.S. and uh, southeastern Canada, and we're going to focus on lake monsters. Um, when I made this data set originally, it was we had just started lockdown. We we're doing this workshop for the first time, and I wanted a fun data set. Um, and this data set turned out to be way cooler than I even thought. Um, so I hope you find it to be interesting. But this is the a data set of. Um, the lake monsters, according to Wikipedia's list. Um, and there's a lot of really cool stories about these um, different um, characters um, that I would encourage you to do some more research on if you're curious. Um, so what we want to do with this map in particular is we want to understand the relationship between the monsters' locations um, and where they are on the planet. We're going to give them some context with um, some things like lakes and state uh, boundaries and things like that. Um, so that's the general premise of what we're going to do. Um, the story that we want to tell um, is where the monsters, these particular monsters reported to live within the Great Lakes area. We want people to understand, you know, not only the locations, but which specific uh, animal goes with each location. Um, and then for reference, we want to have things like lakes and states and things like that so that people can understand. So we've kind of talked a little bit about what the story is, but also what the underlying data needs to be. So um, the data that we have for this workshop, if you've downloaded it, you've seen we have the lake monsters file. Um, and then we also, and that's data that I've already processed for you to make spatial um, and ready to go. Um, we also have lakes from the Great Lakes region, and this is specifically from the Natural Earth data set. I highly recommend you check that out for um, uh, data, underlying data for your maps, reference data, and then also states that came from Natural Earth as well. All of your data um, is coming to you in geo package format. That's an open file format that um, can contain a shape file type data, so vector data. Um, and it is just one file per file, I guess, <laughs> unlike shape file, which is multiple files per file. So it's really nice for um, you know containing data and keeping it organized. So that's why we're doing geo package today. Plus, it's nice to see a different format. Um, a word about data processing. I have processed your Wikipedia lake monsters data. Um, you can read more about um, what went into that. And there's actually an R script in the repository if you're curious about the, the geocoding that went into that. But just so you know, um, I handled your data processing because this is not a data processing workshop. So that's already done. Okay, so that being said, that's the data we're working with. Um, now we are going to start on our map. Um, some important things to note is that we've already pulled out some information about the size of the map we're making. We know it needs to be um, a 
JPEG. I see the comment that we're only viewing my desktop. Yes, I hope you're enjoying the orange tree. I've not opened anything yet. <laughs> Um, and then also we're going to only make one image today. We're not going to have it divided. So um, all that information is in your workshop materials. Um, and I'm now going to open uh, QGIS. So for those of you um, on Windows, this will be familiar. If you're on Mac, Linux, you'll probably know how to open files yourself. Um, I'm going to start on my start menu and I'm going to normal people would search for QGIS. I already have it on my um, start menu pinned because I open it that often but so you're going to start that up I've already started mine just because um, QGIS and Zoom don't get along all the time so um, I've started that up so I knew it would start for you so I'll give you a second to go ahead and, and get your started if you're playing along <clears throat> but this is what it would look like if you're a brand new user so you'll kind of see um, there's a news panel which you can turn off if you don't want it. Um, and then the layers panel shows up. Um, but so yeah, um, that's what it's going to look like once you get yours open. Um, note too that um, while you're running Zoom, QGIS is gonna be a little slow probably because they both require the graphics card. <laughs> so if it feels a little clunky, it'll be better when we're done with the workshop and you can actually um, use all of your resources. So again, feel free to just watch at this point if like you don't have enough screen real estate or you um, things are slow, just sit back and watch and you can you can come back to this. The materials will stay online so you can work through them later. Um, I'm seeing a question that looks like something I can handle later, so we'll skip that for now. All right, so first thing we did was we opened QGIS. We're going to start a new project. Um, you can either use the project menu or you can look for this little icon that looks like a page uh, with the corner turned down. So I'm just going to start a new project. And I'm going to get on the right page of my print materials, which will help. Um, all right, so we've got our new project started up. If you're new to QGIS, but you're familiar with other GISs, this looks familiar. Data is going to go in the middle. Layers go on the side. We're going to open up some panels that are going to go other places later. OK, so we're going to load our data. So what I want to do is I'm going to um, load up the data with the Open Data Source Manager. Basically, this is the Add Data button. Um, I'm going to pick, we're working with vector data, so I'm going to pick the vector data thing on the side. Um, let's see, I'm going to navigate with the three dot button to where I put my workshop material. So your, your data will be wherever you put it. Um, what I am going to do is I'm going to put in all my data at once. So I'm going to click on one and I'm going to hold down control and select the other uh, pieces of data that I want to add. Um, if these were shape files, I would just have to pick the .shp file. I wouldn't have to pick every all the sidecar files, but because um, this is geo package, it's nice and clean. There's only those, and I'm just not going to load the text file because that's the README. I'm going to click open. If you read through this whole long list, you'll see that it's got all the data in there. I'm going to click add, and stuff should show up, which it does. Oh, that's funky. The lake monsters are in a weird place. Oh, somebody's asking geocoding questions. We have a whole other workshop on geocoding, so I'll, I'll skip those for now. Ask them later, though. Um, let me just. Oh, OK, so I got confused by my own data because it put the um, the dots on the bottom. So we have um, the Lake Monsters data set is actually a global data set. That's why you see dots over here on the side. Um, like these are the African ones. There's some Asian ones and things like that, South American ones. Um, but that's why it looks like it doesn't line up. It's because we have global coverage of lake monsters, but I've only had you load the states for the US and Canada. So um, if you were confused, I'm confused. Clearly, I actually have a preview here that shows me that that's what it should look like. Um, but that's OK, because um, it's good to proof your data. So I'm just rearranging my layers to be less confused for me. So I've got my lake monsters, then I've got my lakes, and then I've got my states. OK, so we've loaded up our data, and I'm just going to click Save on my project, and I'm going to save it in my um, folder where I'm keeping everything for this workshop. You can put it again wherever you want. Um, just make sure you can find it if you need it later. 
I'm just going to call it workshop because then I will remember what it was. Um, you can call it again, like if it, this was for like a, a project for um, like research or something like that, I would call it something that made sense for that. Um, it's like it's having a little time saving. So we'll give it a chance to do that. Again, um, QGIS, okay, it's sort of responding again. QGIS and Zoom don't get along. So if things seem a little slow, it's because of that. Once we're off Zoom, you'll see that things are speed up quite a bit. Um, okay, so the next thing I wanna do is I'm gonna change my projection. So I'm clicking down here in the corner um, for the project's projection. I'm just gonna make this smaller so it fits in the Zoom window. Um, the projection that I want to use um, is showing up here on my list because I've already used it before. Um, but if we want to search by number, um, this one is 102008. Um, oops, it picked it for me. No, it didn't. All right, back here. Um, so this is the one I want to use, this North America Albers Equal Area Conic. So um, this is a projection that is specifically for North America, which makes sense because we're working in our map is going to be for North America. Um, if I was working somewhere else, like if I wanted to make the map of like um, the African uh, points, then I would want to pick a different projection. Um, as GIS folks, you probably already know this, but I just want to point that out that um, this isn't, this projection is specific for this project. We're choosing it for a reason. Now it's going to ask me, you know, okay, projections don't line up. What transformation do you want to use? Um, and in this case, I don't think it matters too much. But um, we want to pick one that um, makes you know sense for where we're working. Um, this first one seems to be good because it's specifically for North America. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that one. Um, but you can read through them and figure out which one you think is the best choice. Like, for example, I wouldn't pick this one that's for Florida because we're working in the Northeast. OK, so now everything looks a little funky, but that's OK because we're going to zoom in and then it will be better. Okay, so that is our projection. I'm going to click save again, just because we're running a little slow uh, with the zoom going on at the same time. Okay, so we have our data loaded. We've got our projection set. The next thing I want to do is set my page layout. And you might think, well, let's wait till the end. But I just looked up those specs. So I'm going to do them now before I forget and uh, make sure I know what's going on. So I'm going to project and then layout. So wait, I want new print layout. So I'm going up to the project menu. And then I'm clicking new print layout. When I click on new print layout, it's going to say, hey, what do you want your new print layout to be called? Um, in this case, I'm going to call it nature specs because sometimes we'll make maps for one journal and then need to make them for a different journal later. So I know these are specific to nature. And then it opens up the new print layout. And mine went on my other screen, so drag it over so you can see it. Yours may show up somewhere else. Okay, so now we have our um, new blank layout open. I'm going to maximize this just so that it's less confusing um, in Zoom land. Okay, so we've got our blank layout. Now we're going to set the page size. Um, everything in uh, QGIS in the layout has properties. Um, sorry, we've <laughs> my calico just jumped on the desk and she's like, I need attention. Um, so if you saw ears in the corner, that's what that was. Um, okay, so we're gonna change the layout um, size for our page so that we can have the right specs. So what I'm gonna do is right click here on my page. You can right click anywhere on the, the white space in the middle here. And I'm gonna pick page properties from that right click menu. And you can see that it pops up um, the menu. It probably has tiny, tiny font for you guys in Zoom land, but hopefully if you're following along, you'll be able to see. Um, it's going to offer me different page sizes. If I click on the size, I want to pick custom because none of these work with what I want. Um, so these are all standard page sizes, but um, in the land of making journal figures, I'm always going to need something custom. Um, the other thing to note is that the units for your page, for your custom page size, are over here on the right. So I can change the drop down to whatever um, size that I need. Or whatever units they need but in this case we're working with millimeters because that's the specs they gave us but you know they could come in all different units um, so what i want to do is change my width um, to nature says i can have the width of 183 millimeters and then my height can be um, a range of things but i think 
we're going to put in 240 to start. We'll we'll tighten this up later. We're not going to need all of that space, but that's what we can work with. Um, so, okay, so you can see that it was changing my page size as we went. So I've got my width set to 183 and my height set to 240. Um, if you need if you need all of these any of these specs, um, they are written in the workshop materials too. So um, feel free to reference that if you need it. Okay, so we have set up our page size. Now that's ready to go. So once we get excited about putting our map together, we'll have this ready and then we can just come back here and, and drop the map in. So I'm gonna click save. The save button in the layout saves everything, not just the layout, but also any changes you made to the data. So it saves the whole project. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this part here. So this is our um, layout map layout. I'm going to go ahead and close this. We'll come back to it later, but that's set and ready to go. So like I said, when I get excited about the fact that I made my map and did all my styling, I can just move right into the layout. Okay, <clears throat> so um, the next thing I want to do is start styling my data. Um, so we are going to center our view because we want to work with our, remember our story that we're trying to tell is about the Great Lakes area. So I want to zoom into this Great Lakes area. Um, so I'm going to use my zoom button here. You can zoom in it in a number of ways, but I'm just going to click and drag. And brown lakes, that's super awesome. Um, so note that these are default colors. It just picks something at random. If your lakes are not brown, that's okay. <laughs> if your states are not green, Again, that is okay. We're going to change all the colors to make them something a little bit um, that communicates better, um, something that's a little bit more attractive. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Just um, I'm sort of adjusting, getting a little picky about what I'm looking at. Okay, that looks good to me. But again, you don't need to be in a specific, specific spot. I'm just going to adjust a bit with the drag tool um, and then go back to... Well, that should be fine. Okay, so um, we've zoomed in kind of on the Great Lakes area. It doesn't need to be something super specific yet, um, but you can see we've got lakes, we've got states, and then we've got round points for our monsters. And again, your colors will be different. Um, oh, Naomi is asking if I can show how to do the projection step again. Yes. Um, so I went down to this button down here in the very lower right corner. Uh, Windows is popping up the date and time for me. So helpful. Um, so I'm going to click down here. There are other ways to get the, to this, but I think that's the easiest one to see. Um, and then on my filter, I'm going to tell it um, either the EPSG code that we want to use, or in this case, it's an Esri code. But um, you can filter that way if you know what it is, or you can start searching and it'll start filtering here. Um, does that help, Naomi? Seems like it's good. All right. Um, and then also, the, when you've used other ones, like it it kind of stores them. It knew that last week I was working on this project, so it already had that um, Albers Equal Area Conic saved for me on the frequently used list. Um, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I think we're ready to start styling. So, um, so what first thing we're going to do, I'm looking at the notes here, um, we're going to add the layer styling panel. So what I'm going to do, the easiest way to find this is in any open gray space up here on the toolbar. If you right click, again, it's got to be in blank space, it's got to be on the toolbar. Um, we can scroll down here and look at um, the options. So what I want to do is find the layer styling panel, so panel section up here at the top. Um, so this layer styling panel kind of just north of the center of the list and i want to turn that on um sorry i'm getting distracted by the chat i think alex has the question handled so um so i've turned on my layer styling panel and again to find that i'm going to right click in any blank toolbar space and then pick layer styling panel off the list um, this is nice because it stays open and also automatically updates. Um, so as we make changes, well, it'll just show up. Um, okay, so um, what I want to do then, oh, apparently you can also get to it from the view menu if you want to go that route as well. Um, all right.
Okay, sorry, I have pages, but I need to make sure I'm on the right one. Okay, so what we want to do is we're going to start by styling our states. Um, so what I want to do is click over here in our layers panel, or some of you know this is the table of contents. Um, so I'm going to click on my polygons for my states, the US Canada admin one layer. Um, and you can see that now it's changed um, my layer styling options to this particular layer. So I've got a drop down up here. Um, and that's turned on. Um, what I want to do is work with the, the fill on this. Green is not a great color. And again, we need to work with gray scale. So shades of gray, black, white, grays. Um, so green is not an option. And whatever color you have is probably not what we want either. So I'm going to click on simple fill here. And what I want to do, um, let's see, what am I going to do first? Um, so we're going to work with the fill color first. So by clicking on simple fill, it's going to let me access some of the details of the um, the way that the polygon is styled. So for the fill color, what I want to do is I'm going to make the fill color just plain white. Um, and the easiest way to do that, well, there's multiple ways you can do that. There are a lot of tools up here for different color picking options. So I could pick from here, from this interface, from this interface. Um, the easiest way to do that today um, in terms of workshop stuff is just put in the hex code which is six f's so down here in the html notation if i just type in six f's it'll change it to white five six hit enter ta-da still not looking great however we're gonna make some more changes and it's gonna be better um so again i just put in the html notation is six f's which is the hex code for white um or you can change the other sliders and things like that but um that's one easy way to do it um so next thing i want to do is change the stroke color so the stroke is um graphics language for the outline <laughs> so i'm going to click on that let me go back and show you right there again so um in the stroke color i'm just going to click on um, for mine it was a black outline yours maybe some other color i'm going to click on that colored box and what i want to do is i want to change it to a shade of gray um, and in this case um, again i've got in the workshop materials i've noted that um, if you want to make a map that matches the one that we're making in the workshop materials i'm just going to change the hex code to um, it's going to be alternating letters c and b three times and then that's going to make a gray color um, that's about 80 on the scale here yeah so you can see that um, it's kind of a light gray right now it looks like it's receding a lot um and we're gonna work on some things that will make this a little bit more clear um partially it looks like it's receding a lot to me because the brown is so saturated for my lakes <laughs> um, and whatever color your lakes are it might also be messing with your perception of that but um this is a nice kind of moderate gray for now um we can always make changes later okay so we've got now our um, U.S. Canada states are white with a gray outline, um, and that looks okay for now. All right, so I'm just checking my notes. I think that's all we need to do with that right now. So I'm going to click Save. Um, I see in the chat we're asking questions about coordinate reference systems. You guys are full of good questions, and thank you, helpers, for answering those. Um, keep them coming. So um, the next thing we want to do um, is, so I mentioned that like the, the states look kind of washed out to me. So one of the things that could be happening is because there is no concept of figure to ground right now, because the ocean is white, the states are white, it just looks like a bunch of lines. We might be like, what the heck state is this over here when it's the Atlantic Ocean? Um, what we want to do is give it a background color. So um, how we're going to do that is go up to the project menu, um, which is the one in the upper left corner, um, and then I'm going to pick properties off of that menu. So this one kind of in the middle here. Um, so again, project menu and then properties. And then I'm going to click on that and open up our project properties. And then um, from there, I want to go to our general tab, which is at the very top here on the left hand side. And then you can see um, we've got a couple options. If we wanted to change our selection color, if we didn't like yellow, we could change that. But we're really focused here on background color. And so what I want to do is I'm going to change my background color of my map to the same color as my state, which I believe is this one. Yeah, so it pops up the hex code. So it remembered my um, color choice from before. So I'm going to pick that one. 
Um, so we're going to have our ocean color match the same color as our state's outline, which might seem a little funky, but wait till you see what happens. It's going to make things a little bit clearer. So now that I clicked OK, suddenly your eye can see, hey, look, it's the Northeast. <laughs> um, we have a little bit more context. We've got that figure to ground thing going on that's going to help us understand this. Um, and because we've chosen the same color, um, things kind of work together. Our eye doesn't read that as two separate things. It's less cluttered than it was before. All right. So at least that's my theory. Again, you should play with this and you should make your own maps, but this is sort of the, the process that I go through and some of the kind of rules that I have as I'm making maps um, for research projects. Okay, so that's looking better. Um, the next thing we're going to work on is the lakes, which is really good news because those brown lakes are making me crazy. <laughs> uh, as you can see in the um, in the workshop materials, they started out like bright green, um, which is, again, default colors are almost never the right choice. Okay, so we're going to pick our lakes off of our list. So I'm going to highlight it there. It just changes the thing up here. So I know everybody's working together. Um, so uh, next thing I want to do is I'm going to change my fill color of my lake. So I'm again clicking on simple fill, clicking on the fill color, um, and I'm going to change this one to another gray color, a slightly darker one. Um, and in this case, I'm gonna, again, I'm going to use just the hex codes so we get the same color. Um, and again, this one is alternating uh, two letters, so it's B and F. It's a nice thing about some of these gray hex codes is that they tend to be uh, repeating uh, letters. Okay, so um, now we've changed our lakes to a slightly darker gray. That's looking good. Um, and then I want to change my stroke. And in this case, I don't really care what it picked for the stroke color because I'm just not going to have one. Um, so for the stroke style, I'm going to click on the option there for solid line and I'm going to change it to no pen. And what that means is we're not going to have any outline whatsoever. Ta-da! So now you can see they physically take up less space because they don't have that stroke outline around them. But also now they kind of recede because they're just slightly darker than the ocean and the state lines. They kind of blend in a little bit. So I'm starting to feel better about this map already. It's a little calmer. It's um, now I can see the points a lot better, even though they're kind of for me, they're a kind of weird maroon color. Um, whatever color yours ended up, we can fix that. But I'm already starting to feel better about this map. So I'm going to click save um, so we can save that progress. Okay, so um, my notes say at this point to point out that this is uh, an example of visual hierarchy. We've just made the grays, they kind of recede, and then our points are now starting to stand out because we have um, kind of layered things up in a way that makes sense to our eyes. Um, so next up, uh, we are going to um, work on our lake monster uh, styling. So now things will start to look really clean once we get through this. So again, I'm going to pick lake monsters off my layers list so that it changes it over here. I can also change it in the drop down menu, but I just for some reason this part makes me happier. Do what makes you happy. Um, OK, so now again, simple marker because we want to get into the details of the marker itself. Um, what I like to do um, is for points, this is my personal style. You can work with what you want to work with. I'm giving away my secrets. Um, I tend to like squares for points. You may have noticed that in some of the example maps that I showed. Um, I think sometimes changing up the expected, like it's a point, it should be a circle, right? Sometimes changing up the expected to something else can be really helpful. Um, so sometimes squares are nice. Um, I would avoid things like stars. Watch when I change this to stars. It starts looking a little silly, <laughs> maybe a little juvenile. So I would avoid um, stars, especially with multiple stars. Like one star is fine. I just made a map where we put a star for a, um, a city location, but we wanted that to stand out. In this case, lots of stars starts to look like twinkle stars on the ceiling, um, you know, which can be fun if you're 10, but maybe not so much in a research um, paper. Um, so save that for the, um, you know, the fun maps you make on your own. But I like, you know, I would pick circles or squares here, something simple, maybe diamonds um, could be a good option, but we're going to do squares for now. Okay, so fill color. Um, again, we're making a grayscale map. And if we want things to stand out, this is the most important thing on the map. I'm going to make it the most saturated 
option that I have, which is black. <laughs> so for my fill color, it's not red, it's going to be black. Um, so black, the hex code for that is just all zeros. Um, easy peasy, um, or you can pick it from the slider and just slide everything to one side and you'll get black. Um, and then it has do I don't think I even specified the stroke color because it um, typically it defaults to black so we'll just leave it with black. Um, and then the size of the square you can adjust that um, with the size menu here. Um, I two seem two millimeters seems fine right now so I'm going to leave it as is but you can play with that and decide if you want them bigger or smaller. Um, but again we want them to stand out. These are the point of our map so having them very clear and prominent is important. Okay so all right, so it's starting to look like a real map now, isn't it? Like this makes me happy because before it was kind of odd looking and not what I wanted. So I'm gonna click save, pause and see if there's any questions. Not seeing any pop-up. Okay, so the next thing, I'm gonna dally a bit here and see if you have any questions, but the next thing we're gonna start working on is the labels. So if you've been itching to put labels on the map, we're about to do that. All right, so I'm not seeing anything. Um, just see Naomi checking in. So we'll, I think we'll motor on in the interest of time, um, but let's do some labeling now. Um, so for each label or for each layer, we're going to do some, um, some changes. We are going to turn on the, the labels and then we're gonna pick a font. In this case, I'm going to use Calibri just because it's nice and clean, but feel free to pick fonts that you like. Um, if you don't have Calibri, Arial is a good choice. Um, and then, yeah, so, and we're going to make everything eight point just to, to start. So for my like monsters, I am going to, I'll show you slowly on the first one, then we'll go quick through the other ones. To turn on the labels in the layer styling panel, I want to click on this uh, yellow, looks like a little yellow tag with ABC on it. Right now it says no labels. What I want to do is tell it, I want single labels. Um, there's other options for labels, but we're not gonna get into those at this moment. And for the value, here's where you can change which attribute it's labeling with. In this case, it saw that there was a name attribute. And so it will, QGIS will actually default to something that's labeled as name. So it kind of chose that as a guess. And in this case, it's right. But if you need to change that, you can change it with the dropdown. Um, we'll see how to work with the, um, uh, what do you call this thing? Um, anyway, we'll get there. Um, we'll we'll make changes to the to the attribute um, with a uh, function in a minute. Okay, so um, we've got the labels turned on. You can see it put labels next to all of our dots, which is good. Um, and then we want to make them eight point and aerial. So um, this interface is a little bit. In need of attention, I would say <laughs> um, it's a little bit clunky, maybe, but we're going to start on the left hand side of this list of tabs in the middle here. Um, it's got Arial. I'm going to pick Calibri just because that's what I told you I was going to do. So if I start typing in the um, box, it'll start going to where um, to the alphabetical section that I started typing. So I'm going to pick Calibri here. Um, the font size I'm going to change to eight. So in Zoom land out there, this looks pretty tiny um, and it actually looks pretty small to me right now, but we're gonna start with eight point font. Um, all right, so that's good. Um, we're gonna do this for all of our layers right now, just so we get that out of the way. Click save. Okay, so now I'm going on my Great Lakes layer. It defaulted because it stayed on the uh, label section. So again, single labels. Um, it's saying that it wants to use name. Let's just take a look. That's probably what we want. Again, I'm gonna pick the font that I want and then pick the size is eight point. Okay, that's getting insanely cluttered. I told you we made a good map and now we've made it very cluttered, but we'll fix that. And now I'm gonna do the same thing for my states as well. So again, single labels. It defaulted to name, which I think is okay. Yeah, those look fine. Um, again, you'd want to look at your attribute table and decide which um, which attribute you want to use. Fortunately, all of ours have um, nicely labeled attribute tables. 
All right, so again, I'm going to change the size to eight. So, uh, okay, so for each layer, I just went through and changed, I turned on the labeling, I changed the fonts to the same font, and I changed the size to the same size, and everything is black right now because that's the default. Um, so everything is set up to look the same. Here's an example of when you don't have visual hierarchy. All of your labels are the same size. They're the same color. They're the same visual hierarchy. It kind of looks cluttered. So we're going to fix that next. OK, so what I want to do is I'm going to start with my states. That's what we're on right now. And now in the workshop materials, I've got a list of basically um, different specifications that we're going to change for each layer. There's not a lot of text explanation. It just says text tab, do this. Um, so um, we're going to walk through some of that. So um, for our states layer, um, what I want to do is I want to change my font because right now um, my states, like if you look down here at like Illinois and Indiana, Iowa, um, it's got, you know, regular case for the font and then that makes it look the same as everything else. But we can work with some standard kind of um, not rules, but guidelines for cartography where I can take the state name and I can make it all caps. It will not only stand out, but um, it'll kind of indicate that this is this is a state name in case people weren't familiar. So if I click over here, um, I can click on the little sigma here and then it will pop up this expressions dialog. And so if you wanted to search for things like um, upper, like we're going to use this upper function. Um, we can get um, information about it, how to use it, you know, what are the parameters. Um, in this case, I'm just going to put this in. Oh, it already did that for me. Um, okay, so the function that we wanted to create um, is we're going to use the upper function, which changes all of my letters from upper or lower case. It's going to make them all uppercase. Um, so we don't have to type out a whole new attribute table column for the, you know, type of uh, case we want, we can just tell it, hey, fix these, and it will do it. And so you can see here in the preview for Alabama, it's Alabama in all caps. So OK. All right, so that's looking better. Now we have our state names, all capital letters, which is starting to differentiate those a little bit, um, and will make them stand out a bit from the others. All right, so what I want to do now is change the color of my font. Um, and so the color happens down here, similar to the fill and stroke dialog. Um, what I want to do is pick the same color that I did for my states and for the ocean, um, which is this guy right here. Um, yes. So now you can see the um, it are automatically applied it. Um, the font is now the same color as the outlines, which makes it a little less chaotic. Now you can kind of visually group the state names with the state lines. And now we've suddenly dropped some things out of our um, consciousness. Like it's not it's not super um, we're not super aware of it. If we need them, they're there. We'll read them, but they're not yelling at us like the rest of the labels are right now. OK, so that makes me happy. Um, so we're going to go back here, just click the back button to go back to the rest of the dialogue. Um, so what I want to do next is I'm going to change the letter spacing. So this is on the formatting tab. Um, if you hover over these, they'll have little pop ups that tell you in words what they are. I don't really remember what any of them are called. I write these down for workshops for clarity, but mostly I just go through these clicking one by one until I find the thing I want. Um, so you don't need to remember any of this. You can just click through if you want. Um, we're going to change the letter spacing in this case. Um, so this is going to change the space between the letters themselves. So this is the kerning thing that I was talking about before. Um, I'm going to change it to 1.5. So it's going to add a little bit more space between the letters. So like now if you see like Ohio, it's spread out a little bit more. Um, it takes up more room, kind of indicates that this is a different label than the other things that are spaced differently. Um, and then on the rendering tab, which I think is this guy, yeah, the one on the very end, it looks like a little paintbrush. Um, at the very bottom, there should be an option for overlapping labels. So I'm going to um, let it overlap without penalty. What that's going to do is kind of clutter up some of these um, labels over here, but it turns on all the labels so that when I want to move them myself, all the labels are there to work with. So sometimes we have to start with clutter in order to clarify some things. If I don't have everything on the page, then I can't work with it. So sometimes I'll keep everything up and then start kind of weeding, I guess. Um, 
But so those are all there now. And we'll work with the fact that Connecticut and Rhode Island are all smashed up and New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island are all smashed up over here. We'll deal with that later, but they need to be there to start. Okay, so for the lakes, we're gonna do some tricks on this guy. Um, so in this case, we're gonna do rule-based labeling. So we set up single labels to start, but we actually wanna do rule-based. Um, and what that's gonna let us do is filter on the area of the, of the attribute table. So we're not gonna label all of the lakes, we're just gonna label the big ones. So like in our story, perhaps all these little lakes are not needing to be named. People can look those up if they need them, but we really wanna just give the names of the bigger lakes for reference. So I picked rule base, it put one rule on there. Um, and I'm just gonna work with that. If I double click on it, um, what I can do is give it a name so I remember what it was I was trying to do. So I'm gonna call it big lakes. Um, and then in the filter, what I can do is if I click on the Sigma button, it'll open up that dialog that lets me write expressions. Um, in the fields and values option here in the middle, it'll show me these are all of the columns of my attribute table so that I don't remember, I don't have to remember how to spell them all correctly. <laughs> and, you know, does it have a um, underscore or a dash or whatever? It's already there. Um, what I want to do is I want to, um, let's see. In this case, I actually want a function, but it's nice to know that the fields and values are there. What I want to do is filter on area. So I can look at my options if I search for area. With the geometry functions, there's often two options with the same name. There's the dollar sign one, and then there's the not dollar sign one. I never remember which one I want. So I come here and I read the, um, the help on it, and then I remember which one I want. In this case, I want area with a dollar sign. Um, and so I don't actually need to have one of the columns uh, to operate on. It can just calculate it based on the geometry. And so you can see there's a preview here that says, oh, look, I calculated the area of whatever the first feature was. OK, so um, in this case, I've got area. It's calculating that. And I want area greater than, um, in this case, uh, the number 19 with nine zeros after it is going to get us a pretty good estimation. So let's see, 19 and then one, two. Seven, eight, nine. Okay, that looks good. Um, so I found this number for the area sort of by trial and error. Um, you could, you know, play with that. Maybe you want to um, label some other lakes and, or maybe you want to get some smaller or larger lakes uh, in or out of the selection. You can play with that. But this is just a rough, I literally was like looking at the areas that were in, um, in the, um, the lakes themselves and then figuring out like where do I want to cut this off. So this is just kind of a rough guess. Um, so now you can see we only have labels for the the Great Lakes um, and maybe some of yeah it just looks like we got the Great Lakes in this case. There's other ways to do this to filter. You could certainly come up with other ways to do this um, but that's how I approached this particular one. It also meant that we could work with the same data and not have to do a whole bunch of calculating. Um, all right, so let's see. For the text tab, again, we want, um, so I'm going to go back. Oh, which would I want it? Okay, there it is. Sorry, I got lost in my interface. Um, so they've moved because this is the rule based one. The um, tabs are kind of now further down. Um, oh, somebody pointed out Lake Ontario is missing. It's probably overlapping with something else. We're going to tell it to. Um, to label everything here pretty soon. I bet Ontario will come back. Um, okay, so we want we want to make sure the name is there. Um, and then um, let's see, we've already said that we want the particular font we want. So in this case, now we want to change the color and I'm going to change the color again with the hex code. We want a slightly darker font than the lake color because otherwise it won't show up when it overlaps the lakes. Um, so this one is going to be alternating the number seven and the letter F to get a slightly darker gray. So you can kind of see here, like Lake Huron is, it's visible over the white and the gray of the lake itself. And then again, we are going to need to use the buttons to get over to the side. We're gonna tell it to let us have all of uh, the overlaps without penalty. All right. So it looks like Lake Ontario, yeah, Lake Ontario has come back. It just was overlapping the some of the lake monster names. And so that's why it was not showing up. That's why we need this option, because that way we get all the labels, and then again, we can arrange them the way we want them to and not have the algorithm decide. So I'm going to click Save so we don't lose all of this really good work we're doing. 
Okay, last up, lake monsters. All right, so next thing we're going to do is change all of those labels to be the way we want them. So we've already changed the font, and now we want to make these guys, in this case, I'm over here on the font tab. Um, so remember, we talked about font variants earlier. Um, we are going to pick bold. Um, in this case, so they stand out a lot more. Remember, the point of this map is to show the locations of our lake monsters uh, where they tend to reside. So now they're very clearly popping out. So you can see this is, again, an example of visual hierarchy we're talking about. The lake monster names are bold, they're dark, um, and so they stand out above all of the rest of the things that are going on in the map. They're the important thing. Everything else is gray and kind of recedes away a little bit. Um, the thing that really needs to matter is the thing that's the most different and the most bold. All right, um, so now we're going to do some work with the formatting, and this is really helpful um, for the long names to get them a little bit more compact. Um, let's see, so I want the formatting tab here. So there is a section here um, for the care. Um, it, it's called wrap on character. And what this means is what character do you want to signal um, that it should be the place where we drop a new line in? So you can think of it as if you were doing like a find and replace and find and replace. In this case, we're going to use a comma. And instead of a comma, now I'm going to have a new line there. So if I take that away for a second, um, watch like, um, uh, this one's probably a good one, the Hudson River monster Kipsy um, over here on the east side of the map. Um, so when I change the it to comma, it's going to automatically update the map. And then all of a sudden, OK, it made the thing disappear. That's not what I wanted. But um, this one down here, the um, Beast of uh, Bosco Oscar the Turtle wrapped <laughs> onto the next line. Uh, we'll get that label back in just a second. Um, again, so uh, let's see, what else do we want? We want to change the line height as well. So right now the line height is one, but because we wrapped, I want to tighten that up a bit. So I'm going to put it to 0 0.07, which is going to make the lines come closer together. So you can see like this multi-line one now is kind of squashed a little bit more together. It kind of groups it a little bit better. It looks like one label instead of two. Um, and then again, in the rendering section, we're going to change it to keep all of the things, even if they overlap. There we go. Kipsy came back. Thank goodness. Um, so now we have all the labels that we want as well. And you might have noticed, honestly, like now I'm looking at the map, it looks a lot tighter, even though we've got, you know, these dark labels on here um, and stuff is overlapping. It's it's a lot tighter. It looks a lot different than we just had all the labels on the map, right? Um, things are tightened up. I can visually group things a lot better. It looks like less chaos already, even though stuff is overlapping. Um, so I think we've made some good progress. Um, are there any questions? I see that there's some questions about um, showing a particular step. Um, if you can clarify what step it is you want to see again, I can certainly show that. But otherwise, everything that I've been showing is also in the, the print materials. So um, if we don't end up going back, then um, OK, great. It looks like that's that's taken care of. But anyway, everyone can can check out the workshop materials if there's um, any questions. Hopefully that's a good resource as well. OK, so we have a map. It looks pretty decent. I'm excited. Um, I will tell you, I often say when I start these kinds of maps, I start making ugly maps. I don't worry about making it pretty. I just start making these incremental changes. And obviously, this is this process has been cleaned up for the workshop. I probably tried 10 or 15 different options before I got what I wanted on any given piece of this. So don't worry if you're not like, you know, plopping data in your map and suddenly making beautiful maps. It takes time to come up with these. Um, so don't don't stress if it's taking you a little while. Uh, so somebody's asking, how do we get rid of the space in front of Kipsy? Yeah, that is kind of annoying, isn't it? Um, I would suggest that um, our wrap on character, we change it to comma space. There we go, went away. So it's kind of a regex thing. If you're familiar with regex, you want to figure out like what is what exactly is it you want the search pattern to be? It has to be unique enough. Like I wouldn't want to necessarily wrap on space because then it's going to stack everything up. Um, 
you know, like Hudson River monster is going to be like Hudson then River then monster. That's going to be a little boxy, maybe. I don't know. You could try it and see what you like, but then also you will have commas in there. So maybe it's not worth it. I don't know. Play with it. See what you like. It really depends on the map what is going to be the right choice. So there's not necessarily a, a right or wrong answer. I just want to show you that you do have that option so that you don't have to like make a new column for everything you want. <laughs> you can kind of operate on the text that's already there and not have to do a whole bunch of data processing. Okay, so um, while I'm thinking about it, I'm gonna click save. Um, okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make some adjustments. We've got our labels in there, but there's overlapping labels. We don't like that. We want them to not overlap. Um, so what I wanna do is um, work with the labeling tools. Um, if you want to right click in anywhere in like the blank space, make sure that you have your label tools turned on. Looks like I've got, looking at toolbars, I've got the label toolbar turned on. I'd recommend that. Um, we might also want to turn on the advanced digitize, no, not advanced digitizing. There's another one that might be helpful. Maybe we just want the label toolbar. Let's just start with that for now. So the label toolbar looks like this guy here. It's a bunch of little yellow tags in a row. Yours may be in a different place because it's just where um, where it shows up. Like it, it might show up somewhere else on yours when it gets loaded. So um, what you want to do is look for this row of little yellow tags. Um, what I want to do, though, is I want to start moving around labels. Um, we won't move all of them just for the sake of time because I want to show you how to do the layout stuff. But like um, what I can do is click um, this one with a little arrow on it to move a label. So for, for example, this uh, mana two, I want to get that away from uh, Oscar the turtle. So I'm going to, okay, first time I click, it wants to know what what ID I want to use to register the, um, it's going to save the positions in a table that's going to relate to this one. Um, so I want to tell it what's a unique identifier and FID should be fine for this. But if it's, Make sure you pick the something that's actually unique because if you don't, it will move everything with the same name <laughs> with a matching ID. It will move it all to the same location. So you want to make sure you pick something unique. Okay, so I'm going to pick Manitou. And then when I, you can see it's moving the box around. I'm going to try dropping this label over here to separate it from Oscar the turtle. I'm going to move this guy over just because I'm in that area. Um, let's see. This guy needs to come out of the lake. So I'm just clicking and moving things around. And most of the time, my first pass is just get things off of, like, I don't want them to overlap the, like, um, Peppy here was overlapping the line. Not good. I don't want that. I want to make sure that they don't cross boundaries if I can help it. I want to make sure that things are um, not on top of each other. So I want to give space for other labels. Um, this one might just have to live where it is. So I'm just going to start moving things around and then I'm going to have multiple passes at this. I almost never get them right where they should be the first time. Um, one thing I am going to be careful of is to make sure that the labels are close enough to their respective points that they visually group so that I don't get confused about what, you know, where does this label belong? What is it labeling? So I'm going to keep them close enough that they um, that it's clear what what marker it goes with. Okay, so I can do the same thing with like the lake labels. Um, for Lake Michigan, I want to rotate it. So I can use the rotate button. Um, and then you can see I'm going to be like, well, that looks good, probably about that angle. And then I've got to move it because now it's in Wisconsin. So I can rotate that and put Lake Michigan down the center of Lake Michigan. I might do the same thing with Lake Huron. If I can't find a spot where I can fit the label inside the whole lake, I might want to rotate that. Um, Lake Superior, I can probably get over here. But anyway, so you've got, you have multiple tools. You can move stuff, you can rotate it, um, you can do multiple things with it. And then for like the states, I can do the same thing. I'm probably going to move Michigan, obviously. That one also has an FID, that should be fine. So I'm going to put the label here on the lower part of Michigan. Um, who else? I'm just going to ignore these guys right now. That's a whole nother kettle of fish. <laughs> um, and they might not actually show up when we do our, oh, they will. But anyway, I don't want to spend a ton of time moving the labels today um, because that will take me days. Um, but you get the idea. You have these tools that you can use to move the labels around and change them by hand when the labeling placement is not what you want. Um, I find there's no sense in spending a ton of time with like on top of like this dialogue here. Um, 
Do I want it to be on the whole polygon? Do I want it to be like above the label, whatever? No, just move it by hand. If there's not that many of them, fix it by hand. It will um, go quicker and you'll be happier with the placement. Um, if there's a ton of them, I'm not going to do them by hand. But if there's some key ones that need fixing, I probably will uh, adjust them. But anyway, so that's that's making the adjustments with the labels. Um, I think next up, um, I'm going to save and I'm going to show you the print composer before we run out of time. So I'm going to go back to my project menu and I'm going to open up that layout that we made uh, at the beginning of the workshop. So I'm going to the project menu and then I'm going down to label or layouts. Um, and this layouts option here um, gives us all of the layouts we've previously made. So what I want to do is pick, we only have one because we only made one, but if you're doing multiple maps for a, like a journal article, you probably have multiple layouts. Um, so in this case, I'm going to pick nature specs, and this is the layout that we made previously. I'm going to maximize this just for um, clarity purposes on Zoom. Um, but let's see. So um, all right, I'm just going back to my notes to make sure I didn't skip anything important. Okay, so one important thing to note about this, like a lot of um, a lot of graphic arts tools, everything has properties to it, and you also have to add any element that you want in this layout. You have to add it. It's not going to assume anything. It's not like a Word document where you open it up and it knows you want to put text. It knows nothing. It's just a blank page right now. There's nothing on this. The only thing we've done is set the page dimensions earlier. Um, so what I want to do is um, add, first thing I want to do is add the map. That's pretty standard. Um, the tools that I'm going to be working with are over here on the left-hand side. And I will tell you, I never remember what any of these buttons do. I hover over the button until it tells me the little tool tip that says, oh, that's the add map button. I work with this all the time. I never commit this to memory. I don't know why. Um, what I want to do is it'll, it kind of by default will snap to the corner of the page. So I'm going to let it snap and then I'm going to click oops okay and it filled up the page but you can click and drag and it'll snap to the side of the page in this case it, it made some assumptions about what i want um but so i've got my map in there but the key is you have to add this map it's not going to be there by default um and i've got all this extra space at the bottom but i'm just not going to worry about that right now what matters is that we're going to fill the width across the page because we know we're stuck with this either this width or the smaller width and i think this is a better choice to go with the larger one um, given the kind of map we're making so if i want to adjust the center of the map what i want to do is i want this tool over here that has little arrows in it um, if i grab and drag the map i can reposition it um, if I want to adjust the scale now that I have, um, let me use the select tool and we're going to select that map. Over here in the map map properties, we have the scale um, in numbers. Um, so what we can do, I'm just going to change it to the scale that I uh, think will work that I used previously. So I'm going to use nine with six zeros. So whatever that is in words. Um, so that kind of zooms in on the Great Lakes area and then I can reposition it with a repositioning tool. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the Great Lakes area. That looks pretty good. Obviously, if, if I was working with this for like a journal article, I would know specifically like, oh, this is, you know, this is the study area. But because we're kind of, we're using like a, a toy example, it's, it's a little squishier so we can um, kind of play with it a bit. But if you're obviously, if you're doing this for a journal article, you know what your research topic is, you know what your geographic location is, and you're going to tailor your map to that. Okay, so this is looking a lot better than when we started, right? We've kind of um, narrowed this down. Now we've zeroed in on a very particular location. And now I'm kind of thinking like, you know, we've got, um, we've got some extra space down here. What I actually want to do is I'm going to use the selection tool and I'm going to tighten up this space because we don't need to see all of those states. Um, and it moved my center, so I'm going to recenter that. This is the point in the map making process where you're just making micro adjustments. Like I changed this, oh, now I need to change that. Because I moved this, now the label moved, I need to change this other thing. Um, so it's kind of, we get to the part where there's less rules and more kind of playing with it and making it feel right so that it looks the way we want it to and communicates the way we want. Um, again, everything comes down to that story we're trying to tell and what we're trying to communicate. Um, all right, so this is looking okay. One of the things um, I want to show you is, do you see how our label down here, this label for Manitou, is really far away, even though like 
I remember placing that much closer. Uh, at least I thought I placed it much closer. Um, the trick to this is that our map scale and our um, map canvas scale are different. Um, so it's going to be represented slightly different. So the trick to fixing this is I'm going to copy my scale number from my um, layout. And then if I I'm minimizing that so I can come back to my map canvas and my zoom tools are going to be in my way. So let me move those. I know you guys can't see these, but they're in my way and they won't let me get there. Um, so I'm going to come back down here to the bottom of my map canvas where it says scale. If I highlight everything and I paste that number that I copied from my um, layout and hit enter. Now my scales match. And now I can look at my um, my labels and I'm like, whoa, OK, now I see why it's labeling it that way. So now I would come in and I'd be like, OK, Lake Monsters, let's move your names again. So this guy can be moved closer. This guy can come a little further away. So again, it's another round of moving things and kind of making adjustments and seeing what effect each of these choices has. Um, so I'm going to save that. And then when I go back to my map layout, I need to refresh. So there's this refresh button here. And then you'll see that the labels kind of go back to where they should be. Um, so that's kind of kind of an important thing to know that like the scale has to match for the labeling to be really similar between the two windows. Um, so all the adjustments have to happen on the map canvas, but um, the layout view is kind of where you see the actual problems. So there's kind of a back and forth between the two interfaces. Um, until you get it the way you want it. Okay, so um, we've got, this is by no means what I would be finished with, but in the interest of time, we're going to call it good enough. Um, the last thing that I think I want to do is adjust our canvas um, so that our page is correct. So what I want to do is I'm clicking on using my pointer tool here, a selection tool, and I'm selecting the map. Um, and what I want to do is come down here in the specs to the page size or to our um, our map size, so the position and size option. And what I want to do is copy this height um, number because what I want to do is make the page height the same as my map, uh, I don't know, like my map frame height. So I'm copying that height number. And then I'm going to right click on my white space to look at the page properties. And then I'm going to paste that height number here for the height. Um, and now what that just did was it made my map um my map frame size match my page size so i don't have any overlap um so that's excellent now when i export the page everything will just be that one map and not have that white space at the bottom although a, a lot of times i will leave a little strip of white space because that's where i like to put the legend if i need a legend this map doesn't need one because it's pretty clear what we're doing and again the the figure caption would tell us more about what we're trying to do here and what the reader should know um, but that gives you kind of an idea of um, of what we're working with and some of some of the things you might do. Um, we did not today get to um, making a north arrow or a scale bar, but if you look at the um, the workshop materials, it talks a little bit about what you would do for that. Um, I would honestly in this map because there's not any data here and it's kind of in that lower left corner that's where I would stash those and I would make them very unobtrusive I don't want someone to notice my north arrow unless they really need it so I would make that the same gray as the ocean color slash state line color um, and I'd make it pretty small like people will find it if they need it it should be a very simple north arrow and also scale bar um, I like to make them just like one little gray box with numbers on the ends uh, for this kind of map. If it needs a scale, I'm going to make it super simple because um, the focus needs to be on the data, not on the um, not on the map element. So, um, oh, and the last thing we want to do is export. I think that's important to do. So, exporting in QGIS, um, you have a couple options. You can export as an image, an SVG, or a PDF. Um, SVG is really good if you want to bring this into an art program. I will often bring maps into Inkscape, which is an open source vector illustration software. Um, we're not doing that today, but if you're curious, come see me in office hours for Data Lab. I can show you how that works. Um, so I wouldn't pick that this time. PDF is nice. Again, if somebody wants to, um, oh, but I clicked on that, cancel. Um, uh, if somebody wants a um, something that works with Illustrator, PDF will work, but also plain SVG will work for that too. Um, but 
again, come see me in office hours if you need SVGs. There's some weirdness about how to work with them in QGIS. Um, but I want to pick export image. So um, I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to save it wherever I want to save it. In this case, um, in my workshop materials is fine. So I'm just going to click save. And then it pops up the question about what DPI do you want? So now is where you change that. So if you want 600 DPI, you can change that. Um, or if you know like page width spec stuff like that, um, you can change that here. Um, there's some options you don't need to worry about. And then just go ahead and click save and it will save your image for you. Um, okay, so um, that is, I'm gonna stop my screen share. So that is a very quick run through of the workflow that I typically use when I am making maps for journal articles. Um, so we've got a couple minutes left for questions. If anyone has them, I can hang out for a few more minutes too if we wanna have a quick discussion. Um, but I think what I want to do now is uh, wrap this up and say thank you all for coming. Um, I'm glad you're here and I hope you learned something today. Um, it's been fun. I like this workshop. It's it's a good time, I think. So um, thank you all for coming. I'll hang out for a few more minutes.